Welcome to Westside Community Church. You're watching a message titled Collide by Youth Pastor John Pomeroy. Thank you. Good morning, Westside. Uh, I'm John Pomeroy. So excited to be speaking this morning. And uh, I, I, this is why, like my wife's in my favorite place in the world. It's true. We were on vacation just a couple weeks ago. Couldn't wait to come back and see our kids and be back with our church family. Uh, thank you just for welcoming us this last year that we've done ministry has been amazing. I'm going to talk a lot about that uh, today. Um, and uh, J Pastor John wanted me to talk a little bit about myself, just to kind of introduce myself, because uh, I, I haven't talked to several of you, and um, I, I did want to clear up just some confusion. Um, I've heard just some rumors over the last year. First of all, I'm not like a Zimbabwe foreign exchange student. Um, <laughs> you'd be, no, just wait. <laughs> Um, I wasn't brought back from the Haiti mission trip. <laughs> my, fa my favorite though, my favorite though is uh, after I was here probably for two months, I talked to a couple that uh, they were convinced, they were convinced that I was some tour guide when they were in Jamaica. And they were like, <laughs> they were like, you even have the accent. And I was like, I, I think I talk whiter than most white people. So it was just, <laughs> It was confusing for me. Um, but if you didn't know, I'm a Northern Michigan boy. I'm actually from Indian River, Michigan, up by Mackinac. Um, so I grew up in Northern Michigan, came from a big family. Uh, there were six of us. So I'm a little, uh, I'm still recovering from that in some ways. Um, but I'm a, I'm a middle child. And uh, so, you know, that definitely doesn't help either. And then to top it all off, I was homeschooled. So there was basically no hope for me having a normal life, right? And I go to counseling three times a week. Um, I'm just kidding. But I uh, came from a big family. I did go to public school too, though, and uh, that's where I played a lot of sports. I excelled in athletics. I love sports, and uh, sports were basically, basically my life until I decided to come out of the musical closet, right? And uh, I started playing guitar and drums and piano and bass, and, and uh, it was in high school, actually, that um, God just really developed uh, a passion for ministry uh, in me, for youth ministry and worship ministry. Um, so I, I went into youth ministry, started uh, doing junior high youth ministry right after I graduated, and God brought my ministry here to Traverse City. Um, if, if you talk to me even for five minutes, you know that youth ministry is my passion. It's what sparks me. It's what drives me. Uh, it's what I, I sleep about and eat and dream, and, and it's, it's everything I am. I, I love youth ministry. We've had an amazing year at Elevate Student Ministries. With, we've seen dozens of salvations and, and dozens of lives recommitted, dozens of kids wanting to make the choice to go deeper with Jesus Christ. And uh, it's, been a, it's been an unbelievable year. If you've been thinking about getting involved, yes, thank you. God is good. Amen. God has been so good this year. If you've been thinking about getting involved, now is your time. We haven't kicked off yet. Uh, September 10th, we kick off Wednesday, September 10th. And uh, we're going to have a couple meetings with our small group leaders before that. So if you're thinking about getting involved in becoming a small group leader, it's my little plug for, for Elevate. Um, but just thank you for an amazing year. Thank you for all your prayers. Uh, if you've ever heard me speak, I like to do two things start off. I just like to give the Lord praise for just my salvation, for saving me, for using me. I just like to give the Lord praise this morning. That's the first thing. The second, thing, the second thing I like to do is uh, just thank God for my beautiful, amazingly talented, creative wife who's actually up in the booth running slides right now. Um, basically, everything I do on and off stage is because of her and just her support and her vision and her just being a fighter. And so I just want to give her some praise too this morning. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Rick's standing up back there. Cece's his assistant. Anyways. Um, so anyways, uh, the title of my message today is called Collide, and uh, we're talking about the collision of truth and grace. And in a world that oftentimes likes to pit those two things against each other, we're going to be talking about the idea, if we could become a people that, that worked in the realm of both, that, that utilized and embraced both in our lives, and, and what that looks like. So we're going to be diving right in. We're going to be in the book of John. John chapter 1, and we're going to be all over um, in John, so uh, try to keep up. Uh, but we're going to be starting off in John chapter 1, verse 14, uh, and it reads this, 14 through 18. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me will surpass uh, me because he was before me. From the fullness 
of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is the Father's side, has made him known. And I love the word of God this morning. I love the word of God. I love the fact that God knew that we were going to need an example here on earth, right? And so he sent his son Jesus as our example here on earth. And the scripture says he sent him here full of grace, full of truth. I just, before we go on, and I know Pastor John already already prayed, but I just want to pray one more time, if that's okay. Let's just bow our heads. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for all that you're going to do. God, would you open up our hearts and open up your minds uh, to to just everything that you want to communicate this morning? God, would I be completely out of the way, God, and would every word be your words, God? We cry out in desperation, God. We're desperate for you, and we're lost without you. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, everybody said Amen. So let's jump to John 2.25. We're going to be looking at John 2.25. Like I said, we're going to be all over the place in John. I'm sorry, John 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 23. John 2.23 reads this. Now, while uh, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in man. What was going on here in this, uh, in this scripture is basically there was this group of people, um, as Jesus was doing all these miracles and, and basically the word was getting out about how all these amazing things Jesus was doing, there was this group of people that were basically like, hey Jesus, um, I'm going to come alongside you and I'm going to be your manager and I believe in you and it's going to be awesome and we're going to go to the moon. And scripture says, in, uh, as we just read in John 2, that, that he didn't entrust himself to them because he knew what was in man. He knew the capabilities of man, that we sometimes have a tendency to be wicked and vile, um, dishonest, right? But as we're going to discover, as much as he's a a God who's full of truth, he's also a God of grace. Have you ever, you guys realize that uh, it's so much harder, we have such a harder time as people showing grace to those closest to us, right? Like, our family members, our friends, the people closest to us, those are the people that we have the hardest time showing forgiveness you know, to and, and forgiving and uh, giving the benefit of the doubt, right? Maybe, maybe a spouse. Those are the, hard, the, peop- the people that are closest to us. We have the hardest time. We seem to have the hardest time showing immediate grace to. The interesting thing is I think the opposite is also true. I think we, all, we have a much easier time showing blind grace, right, to those that we don't really know that well, that we don't know that much about, that we, we don't have a full list of, and, and a, a list of wrongs or on necessarily, right? And I think for me, uh, a, a good example was my, my mom, right? She'd go to pick me up from a friend's house and uh, my friend's parents would meet her at the door and she'd be going on and on, my friend's uh, parents would be going on and on about what an amazing kid I was, right? And my mom was like, what? And I I would know that, right? That was me all over the place. I would know that. And so when I would go to a friend's house, I would go all out. I mean, we'd be eating dinner and I'd have a pinky in the air. I would be doing chores, talking in a British accent, right? Because I knew, I knew that when my mom picked me up, that my uh, friend's parents would meet at the door and be going on and on about how amazing I was, right? It'd be like, oh, your son is the greatest thing since sliced bread, and he's going to bring peace to nations and cure cancer. And it was, it's, it was awesome. And the, all the while, my mom's like, are you on drugs? Like, what? <laughs> what? But I, and I think the other thing that we do sometimes is we label ourselves, right? Well, I'm more of a truth person. I'm more of a grace person, right? We would say maybe we lean one way or the other. And I think in some ways it is a balancing act, right? Or, and if we, we don't do it with ourselves, maybe we can point to the person next to us, or, or we can name someone in our lives that we'd be like, they're definitely a truth person. They're about the rules and the facts, and, or this person's more of a grace person, right? My dad was through and through a grace person. Now, I was the kind of kid that was stupid enough to light one of my brothers and sisters on fire just to see how bright the fire would get. And my, my, my siblings would come running to my dad, hey, dad, John, just lit me on fire. My dad would be like, well, I'm sure he didn't mean it. Stop, drop, and roll. You'll be fine. You know, go back inside. <laughs> my dad was through and through a grace person. But I think the issue is when we have that balancing act, and, and I see it with parents all the time, they're trying to, to just achieve this balancing act between grace and truth, and they're trying to be a parent of rules, but also a parent of love and grace. And 
what's so interesting in what John uh, chapter 1 tells us is that Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. And at first, as I was reading that, I'm like, yeah, he was full of grace, full of truth. He mastered it. 50% grace, 50% truth. The issue with that is that it creates this, it, it paints this picture of a savior that had this internal conflict with grace and truth. And he was trying to master the two. And he didn't know whether to hug someone or to punch someone, right? On one hand, he wanted to wrap his arms around his disciples and be like, I love you, you're valuable, you're beautiful. And on the other hand, he wanted to be like, throw punch. You know, get right with God, take up your cross, follow me, get up, stop your whining. And that, that's just not the reality. That's not who Jesus is. You see, that scripture that says that Jesus was full of grace, full of truth, that's not 50% grace, 50% truth. That's 100% grace and 100% truth. Amen? Amen. So, so what does that mean for us? Well, I, I know for me, I, uh, the, the more dirt I have on someone, the more I, I, I know about someone, uh, I, I, you know, we all make that list of wrongs. We try not to, right? But we do. We have this, this, this list of wrongs and, and we, can, we can pull up in an instant just if we think of one person, uh, all the terrible things they've done or that we've heard they've done. And I know for me, when I have people like that in my life, I, I'll give grace, but it's, it's in moderation. <laughs> Well, I'll give grace, but it's, it's going to be on my terms. It's going to be in moderation. And the beautiful thing about our Savior Jesus is he sees all the dirt. He sees all the muck. He sees the terrible things that we think. He sees the things that we think are kept in darkness and secret that no one else knows about. He sees even those things, and he says, grace, I extend to you. Full grace. He's full of grace and full of truth. I love that. It's full of grace full of truth. So uh, John chapter 2 verse 25 ends talking about how he would not entrust himself to those people because he knew what was in man. The greatest thing is as, it, as we move to uh, chapter 3 is he ba God basically seeks to give us an example of what that is by talking about a man named Nicodemus. Now he's, a, he's an interesting character. Now we don't know a whole lot about him but he was a Pharisee and he was part of this intense, strict, sect group of Pharisees called the Sanhedrin, right? And, and they were, he was the ones that you would not want to run into him if you weren't on your A game, right? If you weren't on your A game as a Jew, you would not run, want to run into one of these guys. And he was one of the worst. He, he would punish Jews uh, he, by upholding all of this, you know, religious mumbo jumbo. And, and it was just, he was not someone that you'd want to be friends with. You'd see him 10 feet away and you'd want to run in the other direction. The interesting thing, though, in chapter 3, he, uh, he meets with Jesus. He, he wants to meet with Jesus. Now, he, he's curious, right? He's curious. He wants to meet with Jesus. But my, my thought is he probably didn't connect with Jesus and said, hey, you know, I'm really curious about this whole Christianity thing, this whole Jesus thing. Maybe we could talk about it. You could teach me some more things about it. My guess is he, he used his um, political and his, his, uh, just his status to basically strong-arm Jesus into a conversation with them. Scripture says that they met with him at night. As I studied, I realized that he basically met with them at night so that his Sanhedrin buddies wouldn't find out about it. That, that would look pretty bad. So I immediately don't, didn't have much respect for Nicodemus going into the story. But Jesus being full of grace and full of truth. Scripture says just a, just a couple verses ago that he knew what was in man. He saw what was in Nicodemus' heart. But he says, yeah. Nicodemus, let's meet. I'll meet with you. I think there's a, there's a message even there that God will meet you where you're at. In the, in the, the wickedness of our heart and, and in, in the, 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 the motives that we have, he'll meet with us. In the, the dark, at an inconvenient hour, he'll meet with us. And he did. So he said, yeah, let's meet. Everyone went to sleep. Nicodemus and Jesus um, continue to talk, and, and they're going back and forth, and with every, every word that Jesus utters, it's just a barrage of, of biblical truth, and until finally they come to one of the, the most uh, profound and well-known uh, scriptures, which is one of Jesus' responses. If you've ever seen Tim Tebow play, you've, you probably know what verse I'm talking about, right? John 3, 16, and uh, they're going back and forth, so finally Jesus says, to answer your question, Nick, I, I, I would have to say this. For God so loved the world, Nicodemus, that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, Nick, but have everlasting life. And Nick, God didn't send in his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
And then verse 18 in John 3 says this, that, that light has come into the world, Nick, and because, because people love darkness, because people love darkness, they, they don't go into the light, they don't pursue the light, Nick. This was the point as I was reading in scripture that I was wondering why Jesus wouldn't take Nicodemus by his garments and say, hey, Nicky, they're talking about you, slugger. <laughs> it was confusing to me. But I want to know the answer why? Because Jesus is a God who's full of grace, full of truth. He didn't have to point fingers. He didn't have to shake, any, you know, shake anyone's garments. He didn't have to slap anyone in the face to get their attention. He just calmly and passionately communicated the truth in love, full of grace, full of truth. The interesting thing is that scripture doesn't really go on to say too much more about their conversation. We don't really hear too much more about Nicodemus, but what happens later? In John chapter 19, just a few chapters later, there's a man, a rich man named Joseph, and he was going to claim the body of, of Jesus, take him to a tomb to be buried, and there was a man that was with him helping him do all of this, and his name was Nicodemus. So maybe that conversation worked. I love that depiction of a God and seeing the effects of someone who operates in a realm of full grace and full truth. I love that story. The interesting thing about that story is there's no huge moment of conversion where it says, you know, Nicodemus got on his knees and wept after, you know, G Jesus said John 3, 16 and began to cry. And... But I love that story. You see the effects. And, and in the next story, is the same thing. John chapter 4, we're going to read. Um, Jesus had to go to Galilee. He had to go to Galilee. The, the reason that was an issue was because he had to go through Samaria to get to Galilee. And the reason that was, that was a problem was because there were Samaritans in Samaria, right? They were a mixed ethnicity, so they were considered unclean. They were considered, they, they were not someone a Jew would ever want to be around. Of course, Jesus knew that, right? Because he's Jesus. He's full of truth. He knows everything. So he goes anyways. Now, he's ahead of his disciples at this point. And the thing I love about Jesus, and the common thing that, we've, that Jesus and I have shared through my whole life, is we both love awkward situations. And Jesus will see an awkward situation a mile away, and he'll just run at it. He doesn't get shaken by that. He thrives in awkward situations. I love that about Jesus. So, knowing he has to go through Samaria, knowing there's a pretty good chance he's going to run into a Samaritan, he, he starts to head to Galilee, goes through Samaria, and then who does he meet? A Samaritan woman. Now he's by himself. He's not with his disciples anymore. And he's, he meets a, a uh, Samaritan woman. Now the only thing that could make this worth, worse is that they're alone. Jesus, well, Samaritan woman, alone. And this particular woman, just to, just to top it off, has this issue. She really likes dudes. She's like the original Desperate Housewife, right? <laughs> I mean, her story is like the first soap opera ever written, as we're going to discover here. And Jesus knew that, right? He's full of truth. He's full of grace. He comes on the scene. He's not, he's not nervous. He's not, he, he sees the awkward situation. He's like, yeah, let's do this. He comes on the scene full of grace, full of truth, approaches the woman, says, hey, can I have a drink? She says, you talking to me? Yeah talking to you. Can I have a drink? She says, well, I'm a, I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. I'm a woman. You're a man. Uh, this, is, this is awkward. You know, she's, she has an issue with the awkward situation. Jesus doesn't. The interesting thing is with every response that she gives Jesus in their conversation, it's just a ploy to get the focus off of herself, off of her sin. But Jesus saw all of that. He saw all of that even before he headed to go through Samaria. So they continue on in conversation. Jesus starts talking about this water. So she tries another excuse to get Jesus off her back. And, and, and uh, she says, well, you know, this well's too deep. There's nothing to draw the water out with. Sorry. Jesus says, okay, well, I, I, I want to talk to you about living water. I want to talk to you about living water water. And he goes on and on about this, this living water. So finally, her interest is piqued, and she says, okay, all right, let's talk about living water. Um, so this living water that you, you're talking about, can I, can I have some? Where do I, where do I get it? And uh, Jesus pauses here for whatever reason. He pauses, he stops this part of the conversation, and he's like, hey, why don't you go get your husband? 
why don't you go get your husband? Now, at first, I didn't know why he just kind of changed the, the, the conversation like this till I realized it was one of those fantastic moments in Scripture where Jesus asks something or requests something of us that he already knows the answer to. He already knows the punchline. And it's not to prove how amazing and spiritual and all-knowing he is, but it's because he knows that in our response, our response will reveal something that we need to know about ourselves. So he says, why don't you go get your husband? She says, I have no husband. Jesus replies, that's right, you've had five husbands. You've had five husbands. And the man you're with now, he isn't even your husband. So what you're saying is true. This would be the point where the soap opera music starts playing, right? He says, so what you're saying is true. The woman says, and this is one of the, the most awkward responses to me in all of scripture. She says, I can see you're a prophet. There's not even an exclamation point there. That part just confused me. This man's saying intimate details about your life. Let's face the facts. You, you, you've been married five times. The, the man you're, you're fooling around with now isn't even your husband. And you're still continuing to play games with God, and she does. She continues to play games with God and starts going on about worship and trying to have all, and talk all this Christianese. And Jesus, even knowing her heart, seeing her heart, remember John chapter 2, he sees the heart of man. Knowing all of this, he says, okay, let's talk about worship. And so he does. In chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 21, Jesus declares, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will uh, worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Even, even with a ploy that this woman is, 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 is talking to try to get the focus off of her sin, Jesus plays her game and he continues to communicate the truth with grace. And it's uncomfortable for her sometimes, isn't it? And it was uncomfortable for her. What does she do? She, she just tries to end the conversation. She's just kind of fed up with Jesus at this point. And she says, well, when the Messiah comes, the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Basically, Jesus talked to the hand. I'm not having it. I love Jesus' response. I imagine the woman probably turned to walk away and Jesus says, oh, hey, miss, um, that man that you speak of, I am he. The man you speak of, I am he. This was probably the biggest jaw drop moment in, in biblical history, right? Where she realized this Messiah that, that, he, that she was going on about is standing right in front of her. But like the Nicodemus story, I was interested to find that there was no, this, this huge conversion moment where the, this woman got on her knees and began to weep and, and ask for forgiveness. And No, but what's interesting is Jesus rejoins his disciples and the woman, she goes to her hometown and she tells all the people, uh, she testifies to all the people about what she just experienced, about what she just saw. And it says that, scripture says that people began to become followers of Jesus because of this woman's testimony. This imperfect woman that would be considered lowest of the lows because of one conversation full of grace, full of truth, now is testifying and creating followers of Jesus Christ. I love that story. Uh, over the summer, I got to... Uh, experience one of the most amazing collisions of grace and truth um, at a camp that the junior high do. Um, it's called Battle Cry Camp. It was my, the first year ever doing this camp. It was a five-day camp. I was really excited about it. Uh, the, the thing was, going into the camp, the first two days were rough. And that was an issue for me because all year long, I felt like God had been telling me, this is the event. This is the time where everything changes. This one camp is the ch camp that's going to completely change the face of your youth group, potentially change the face of the, your church and in, in, in this community. I was excited about it. I was casting vision to my leaders all year long. I had been working on the camp since September. I was excited about it. 
the first day happened, it was an okay day. Worship was just okay. The activities were okay. Day two, same thing. I was getting discouraged. I was ready to throw in the towel. Something happened Wednesday night though. We were having a Wednesday night chapel. I felt like God just wanted me to kind of open up the floor, right? And just say, hey, if you guys want to stay and pray, you can. Otherwise, you know, go play games. And I watched every student that was at that camp have a collision of the truth that they learned that entire week, the truth that they've been learning at Elevate all year, colliding with a full understanding and a full comprehension of the grace of God. And the result was absolutely spectacular. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I'm talking about kids praying on their knees before the Lord, and I'm not, not prayers like, oh God, you know, help, help uh, those in need and, and bless this food. I'm talking about kids on their face, weeping before a holy God, begging God to forgive them for their spiritual complacency, asking God for them to, to, to make them a leader in their school, to be a beacon of light in their family, in their community. And they prayed not for one or even two hours, for three or four hours. And I had to actually send them to bed. This happened two nights in a row. God is good. <laughs> Want to know the, uh, the, thing about, uh, the thing about truth is when you remove grace out of the equation, they're just facts. It's just truth, it's just intel. It's just information that we have, right? It's kind of like the saying, and you, you probably have heard this saying, it is what it is, right? Your situation is your situation. What you're going through is what you're going through. The trial that you're in right now, the storm that you're in, it's just a trial or a storm, it is what it is. The beautiful thing about our Savior Jesus is when he came to earth and he married full grace to full truth, our situation, that truth, what it is, became now what it can be. Amen. We have hope because of that. Amen. We can live in hope because of that. Can we stand together? I believe there's two kinds of people here today. I believe there's two kind of pe kinds of people here today. And uh, the first person, I think it's the person that maybe has, has known truth their whole life, right? You've been going to church your whole life. You've been, you know the scriptures, right? You know what the Bible says. You're a truth person. But maybe at night, as your head hits the pillow, maybe you're still feeling empty and broken inside because you have, maybe haven't fully uh, experienced the grace and the love of God. You haven't, you haven't had that, that tangible experience with the love of God. I wanna pray for you today. But before I do, I wanna say this. I think there's a second person here today. And I think it's the person that's like me that, that have, has experienced the love and the grace of God in their life. They've embraced that in their life, right? They, they, you, that's not an, a hard issue for you. That's not a hard thing for you to accept. I mean, you, you can even inspire other people because of that knowledge of the grace that you have. But you're still left wanting at the end of the day because maybe you haven't embraced the truth of Scripture. The truth in this book, truth that says, today you're more than the weight of your past mistakes, that you've been remade. First Corinthians says this, if anyone, if anyone, man or woman, is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have gone. Behold, new things have come. God has made us new this morning, and it's time we start believing that. Amen? Amen. I want to pray for you this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to pray for you this morning. And I want to pray that, that God would, would reveal something to your heart, that you would have an experience here this morning before we worship, that this would be your moment. It's a free gift. Take it. It's yours. So God, I, I just lift your name on high this morning. God, would we be people of truth and get grace? Would we become husbands and wives of truth and grace and parents of truth and grace, siblings of truth and grace, Father God? Would you give us that, that hope? Show us the way, God. I believe there's people here that need to experience your grace and love in their life. God, would be, today be the morning? I don't believe that just happens at a camp in Calcasca with junior high kids. I believe it can happen right here, God. So God, would you do something just supernatural in this place this morning? Would t tomorrow, t t today, God, as we leave this place, would everything be different? I pray for the person that maybe needs to instill some truth, God, in their life, that needs to embrace that truth that they know and believe it for more than just words on a page, God, but for as your truth, a, a spiritual truth, God, truth that can change their life forever. And only you're strong enough to do that, God. So we pray that you would go before us. Only you're strong enough to accomplish this inside of us, God, and only you are strong enough to save us. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. Thank you for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you at one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m.